Turn to page 177. Are you washed in the blood? Okay. All right. We'll ask all those who are able to stand and sing nice and loud. Sing praises to the Lord this morning. seated. Just a few announcements before we get into our worship service. We do not take offering up per se by passing the plate, but we do have metal boxes at the entry exit doors in the sanctuary if, if you want to deposit it. Um, that's where you would do so. If you are a visitor and visiting the very first time, first of all, we'd like to welcome you. And um, we're so happy you came to join us this morning. We also have a welcome packet that we give out to all of our visitors the very first time they're here. So be sure, if you didn't get one on the way in, stop at the Welcome Center on the way out, fill out a card, and you'll get a free gift. Pretty good deal. <laughs> Everyone is invited to a luncheon immediately following this morning's service in our fellowship hall. Please feel free to come if you didn't bring anything. We always have plenty of food. And then uh, just a note that evening service and choir practice is canceled tonight. And those that are interested, we are still ordering Lakeside T-shirts. And uh, we're going to be offering those, and the orders will be final by next Sunday. Please feel free to sign up in the Welcome Center. And we are now offering 3XL to 5XL sizes. Also, there's a men's breakfast this coming Thursday, April 26th at 9 a.m. at the Farmer's Cafe in Carleton. So if 
um, you want to see these and other announcements, please pick up a bulletin on the way out. And I have a special card to read. Thank you so much, church family, with sincerest thanks for your kindness and your thoughtfulness. Thanks to my church family for all the food, love, and prayers after my surgery. Love, Mary Broyles. And we're so happy to have Mary with us this morning. Thank you. So most of you have, should have received, uh, when you came in, uh, a slip with some uh, lyrics on them. And at this time, we're going we're gonna to sing those songs this morning. Uh, we'll ask everyone to stand who is able and, uh, again, sing praises to the Lord this morning. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day. Oh 
What precious songs. We exalt him. If we lift him up, he promised to draw all men, women, boys, and girls to himself. I always say our job is to do the lifting. His job is to do the drawing. And I just am so thankful that you're here today so that we together can worship. Worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. God's been giving us such good revival services each evening. Uh, If you weren't able to attend, uh, just know that God moved in a great, great, mighty way. And we're expecting more of the same this morning. Now, let me make one correction on what Linda said. Uh, She said service this morning, dinner. And I like what she did say. She said, if you didn't bring anything for the dinner, that's okay. You come down there anyway. Uh, We've only come close one time to running out of food. And we've got enough restaurants close by. If we look like we're about to run out, we'll send out. And uh, so you come and share in that with us. And uh, Brother Damon has felt so preachy that after we finish dinner down there, we're going to come back in here and have service again. So that will be somewhere, I'm guessing, around 2.30. I'll let you know at the end of the service. So you plan on that. You plan on staying, would you? Uh, I know that maybe uh, your plans call for other things. But if you're willing to stay, I'm pretty sure God's willing to bless you for doing so. And uh, when you get a preacher preaching like he's preaching, it's hard to stop him. And it's, that's good. That's a good thing. Y'all sung awful sweet this morning. <laughs> Awfully sweet this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus, for the life that we have the abundant life that is ours in him, the relationship that we have through him to you. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who lives within our heart. Lord, we thank you for Brother Damon being here with us. Oh, Lord, how you've ministered through him and how lives have been touched and changed, souls saved, lives recommitted to your kingdom's work. And I pray this morning that we might enjoy more of the same. We ask your precious Father that you'd meet with us in a great and a mighty way, and we will forever be thankful. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. When they finish their song, you'll hear a bell. If you have children that you'd like and What's that mean, Kathy? No children's church this morning? Evidently, there's no children's church this morning. As I journey through this, <laughs> as I journey through this land, see. As I go on, pointing souls to Calvary and to the crimson floor, many arrows pierce my thoughts and turn my thoughts aside, but my Lord leads me. Service, I'm. 
from the mighty deep and the Lord directs my path he does safely keep and he leads me gently on through this world below he's a real friend to me and oh I love him so oh I want to see him look upon his face there to sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory let me lift my voice here's all past home and last ever to rejoice oh i want to see him look upon his face there to sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory let me lift my voice From the mighty deep and the Lord directs my path he does safely keep and he leads me gently on through this world below he's a real friend to me and oh I love him so oh I want to see him look upon his face there to sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory let me lift my voice cares all past home at last ever to rejoice oh i want to see him look upon his face there to sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory let me lift my voice cares all past home at last ever to rejoice That's almost enough to make a Baptist get happy, isn't it? Mm. There's a special section in heaven. Do you know that for the Baptist? <laughs> they got a big, big fence all the way around it. And there's no clapping in there. There's no amening in there. There's no getting excited in there. Once you go in, all that's left behind. <laughs> but every once in a while, we tear the rafters down, don't we? Boy, I tell you, as I said earlier, God's been blessed us so much this week. Uh, we began Thursday night in revival services, and uh, you've been missing some really good preaching if you weren't here, but you're here this morning, and I, uh, I keep telling him every, every day uh, while we're eating, uh, all he's been doing since he's been here is eat and preach. And, of course, I never did want him to eat all by himself, so I'd help him a little bit. <laughs> And, uh, but I keep telling him, if you do better than you did last night, you'll have to go some to do that. And he's, he's excelled every, every service. I want you to listen to him as he comes this morning. Uh, former pastor at Monroe Missionary Baptist Church in Monroe. Uh, most recently, pastoring down at uh, Clear Springs in Corrington, Tennessee. And uh, he's been doing some wonderful preaching up here. You pray for him. He'll preach as good as you pray, uh, Brother Damon Patterson. Damon, would you come? Thank you, my brother. Thank you, brother. It sure has been an honor to be here these nights. I'm grateful for the opportunity that's mine, and I just pray that the Lord will say something through me that might benefit somebody. Your, your pastor is a gracious host. 
He thinks somehow that I need to be fattened up. <clears throat> I'm fat enough, but he keeps insisting, and I'm grateful to him for all of the, the marvelous hosting that he's done and the privilege to be with him in service because he has the desire to see you develop into the church that God is pleased with, and that's the thing that's so important. I'm grateful for what you're doing. I appreciate your building that you've built, and I'm so thankful that God is using many of you in marvelous ways, and so let's just continue to go in that direction. I want to see him. They sung that song, I want to see Jesus. I believe that he was more than just a historical figure, more than just somebody who lived 2,000 years ago. He was the Son of God, the Messiah, the Lord God himself that was here in the flesh, and he has given us instruction in the Word that there's only two places to go after this is over, and all of us know that we're going somewhere. We're going either to heaven to be with him or to hell to be in punishment forever. And I want to avoid that one place, but I want to go see Jesus. Find in your Bibles the 13th chapter of Luke's gospel, please. 13th chapter, please. <clears throat> And when you've found it, would you stand with me, please? <clears throat> In the 23rd verse, Luke 13, 23, Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and has shut to the door, and ye be begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Then shall you begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy, your, thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see, shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south, and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. Father, this is your word. I don't have the ability to decipher it. I don't have the ability, Father, to explain it. It was written by the men of old as the Holy Spirit of God inspired them to write. And I pray, Father, that the same wonderful Holy Spirit will help us today, that we can bring forth from these verses, something for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. May you be seated, please. <clears throat> One Pharisee, apparently, because it says that the scribes and the Pharisees will be cast out. One Pharisee would say unto Jesus, are there few that be saved? His name is not even given. We don't know who he was, particularly are there few that be saved? And I'm sure he's thinking, are there few of us? He must include himself in that number that's going to be saved. Are there few that be saved? It's a very impractical kind of question. It has no, no practicality for him at all because what difference does it make if there's a million or 10 million or a billion people that be saved? The question, the, the question that would be important to him Am I saved? Or are, how do I get saved? That's the question that's important. Not how many. It doesn't matter. We've got a lot of people that think they're going to heaven that won't get there. But we need to make sure ourselves. And so Jesus doesn't answer that question. He says, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say, shall seek to enter in 
and shall not be able. A lot of folks think they're going to heaven. So what does it mean to be saved? I probably would be best for us to begin with what it's not. To be saved is not membership in a church. A lot of folks have church membership. Jesus was saying in this very passage that there would be those who would say, Lord, we did mighty, in, in the Matthew's chapter of same passage, Matthew says that Jesus said, there'll be those who say, we prophesied in your name. We did, we cast out devils in your name. We did mighty works in your name. They were members of churches, had to be. But he said, depart from me, I never knew you. I don't know who you are. That's not, to be saved is just more than be a member of a church. We can join churches. You can fill out a card or you can be baptized. You can join a church. But there's more to it than, than that when we're talking about being saved. How shall I be saved? That's the question that's important. And I think that being saved is more than just a quiet deathbed experience. I've had upward of 900 funerals that I've had the responsibility to conduct. And then some I didn't know, know the person. And I'd get with their family and say, tell me, is this person safe? Well, they just went to sleep so peacefully. They must have been all right. That has nothing to do with it. We can die a martyr's death and go to heaven, or we can die peacefully and go to hell. That's not salvation, how we die. Because Stephen was being stoned to death. And I'm sure that as those stones were bashing out his brains, he looked into heavens, it says, and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father to welcome him home. And he was saying, lay not this sin to their charge. Stephen died a martyr's death, but God blessed him in a marvelous way. So I believe it's more than just that quiet deathbed experience. And it's more than being preached into heaven by some preacher after the, the death and the funeral has taken place. I had an elderly couple in my church in Tennessee. They had a son in Knoxville that was a doctor, a very prominent doctor. I guess maybe he had done a lot for a lot of people. But I knew a lifestyle that he was living he had divorced, not divorced, he just abandoned his wife and family and was living even when he died with his receptionist nurse. And yet when I, I thought out of, out of that respect to his parents, I went to the funeral and that preacher preached that man into heaven so beautifully. Because he was a doctor, it didn't save him. Because he had done something for other people, didn't save him. He needed an experience with Jesus Christ. An experience that comes only as we seek to, to make that profession. And you know, one thing else, a profession of faith is not salvation either. We Baptists are long on professions because we feel like Jesus called people to make public that profession of faith, to confess it publicly. And over in Romans it says, we believe with the heart and with the mouth Confession is made into salvation. We believe in profession, but through the years, I believe I've seen a lot of folks who professed but didn't possess. They didn't have anything. They professed, they, they went through the motions to say, yeah, I've accepted Jesus as Savior, but it was all with the head. They didn't mean it with the heart. To be saved is more than that. To be saved is something that causes us to recognize that we're on a journey that leads from here all the way to heaven. A journey that we've never taken before. A journey that we need to have somebody to guide us. And that guide is named Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so we need Jesus in our life personally. And I believe that I need to recognize that in my life. You know, really, our natural state as individuals, as human beings, our natural state is one of ignorance. Oh, we like to think we're so intelligent and we've just got so much brain work and we've, this, our generation is so fantastic because we've even gone out into space and we've done so many things scientifically. 
but we're still ignorant. Tell me where you'll be five minutes from right now and tell me that for sure. You don't know. I don't know. And something else that we don't know, we, these beautiful babies that we seek all around us, nobody knows about this thing called birth. How that a drop of fluid in that mother's womb becomes impregnated and that little drop of fluid develops into a little person in there. And over in Ecclesiastes, it says, and thou knowest not what the way of the spirit nor how the bones do grow in the womb of, the, of her that is with child. How the, in that little drop of fluid, bones develop and hair and pretty little blue eyes and all of those things develop within there. Nobody knows how. Oh, we, we see it happen. It, it happens every day. But we don't know how it does it. That's God creating within there. But you know, to me, a little sideline, to me it's sad that we get to the place that we think we're so smart that it's so perfectly all right for us to kill that little thing. Only God could do it. Only God could create it. But we have a legal right to kill it. Isn't that sad? We think we're smart. We're ignorant. And we need somebody to help us in our ignorance to find the way from here to glory to the place that God has gone to prepare for us. Our, and, and another thing, we have a natural proneness to goodness a proneness to evil and a, an aversion to goodness. My parents didn't have to teach me how to be wrong and evil and mean. They didn't have to teach me that. I had that on my own. But they have to teach you how to be good. How many of you ever had to teach your kids how to say bad words? How many of you had to teach them how to misbehave, how to be unruly, Ah, but we have to teach them how to try to be good. And that's difficult. It's good. To be good is difficult. And we have to sit still when we ought to be jumping up and down. Well, anyway, we're, we have that tendency, and we need somebody to help us. His name is Jesus. How marvelous it is that we can have salvation. Are there few of us that be saved? Salvation demands faith. Faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, lest you should boast. It's a works of, the work of God. It's not the works of man. Not, not, man should not, cannot boast about. I can, if, if salvation were by works, some of us would boast that they, we got ours the easy way. And some of us would boast that it, I gave a lot more into it than you did. Salvation is not by works. It's the gift of God through that marvelous thing called faith to believe that somehow, somehow Jesus Christ could love the world enough that he was willing to depart from the portals of glory and come to this earth to be crucified because he came to his own, his own received him not, and those around nailed him to the cross. And the Jews would say, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. Jesus loved us enough that even from the cross, he could pray, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I had a difficult time as a young pastor in one occasion. And I found myself in the empty church building in the middle of the night in prayer. My wife didn't know where I was and no one else, but I was in that empty church building praying. And it was almost as though I could feel his hand on my shoulder saying, it's all right. What's happening to you is only a little bit of what happened to me. And I could hear him saying, forgive them. 
for they know not what they do. God's love is so tremendous that to be saved means that we have faith to believe that somehow, somehow, even though we had been created by him and he had every right to destroy us, instead he could love us enough to send his son to die on the cross for us, to purchase us from our sins. When our oldest son was probably about four years old, I'm not sure, but there was a little accident while they were playing and he cut his eye pretty severely. I rushed him to the doctor and, and at that time they couldn't, they couldn't numb it. They had to have some stitches and so they insisted that I help hold him on the gurney and I was doing so. And those little eyes were looking up at me almost as though he was saying, Dad, why? Why aren't you doing something? They're hurting me. And I think from the cross of how my Savior would say, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? The pain is almost more than I can bear, but I'm willing to do it. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. I thank God for the privilege to being saved by faith, by trusting in him. And I believe it demands also the fact that we deny ourselves. The only person that we don't like to deny is us. We can deny everybody else. But deny self is difficult. When it comes to the place to, to make sacrifice on our own, difficult. But Jesus said we must deny ourselves, take up the cross to follow him. But you know how marvelous it is when, when children are born, they have characteristics that resemble their parents. Black parents expect that little baby to be a black baby. Chinese parents expect that it's going to be a little yellow baby. Indians, it's going to be a little red baby. Caucasians, it'll be white. And then there are, sometimes there are some characteristics, almost like birthmarks, the color of hair or the ears or the nose. But I believe that God's people have birthmarks as well when they're saved by grace. Years ago, we had in our church in Tennessee a visitor from Nigeria. He was black as could be. And I asked him if he would mind explaining to the congregation those horrible scars on his cheeks. And he stood to say, when, when I was born, we had no cameras, no photographs, no pictures could be taken. There were no fingerprints, no birth certificates. So soon after I was born, some elders in the church would slice my cheeks in a certain pattern and then fill those wounds with ashes and soot so that they would never heal smoothly. The reason being, if I for some reason got separated from my tribe by kidnapping or by, by get lost or whatever and could make my way back, this was an identification. The elders could say, he's one of ours because the marks indicate that he's from our tribe. He's one of ours. You notice what the scripture says over in 1 John chapter First John chapter 2, hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. We can know a person by that birthmark of the law he keeps. If he lives just like the devil all the time, I'm not sure that he's a Christian. If he lives by the law of Satan, it's a good indication. See, I grew up in Fred Patterson's house. And like most boys, I could come home sometimes and say, Mr. Pierce lets his boy do this and that. I don't care what Mr. Pierce does. You are in Fred Patterson's house. 
Jesus is saying to us, it doesn't matter what the rest of the world is doing. You live by my standards, by my law as a birthmark. Second birthmark over in the third chapter says, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whoso hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Love, what the world needs. And, and sometime back in this, there was a popular song, what the world needs now is love, love, love. We need love, but not the kind of love that the world's praying for. They want that physical love. The love that we need is the love of God that's manifest through our lives. Loving people. There are people all around us that are on their way to hell that need love. They need you to be loving them and loving them into the kingdom by the law he keeps, by the love that he shows. And then also it says in the last verse of this chapter, and hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. And the spirit of God indwells our lives and we become so willing to do God's blessed will. I'm grateful that we can have birthmarks. And some of you have indicated yours and I'm so grateful. But back to the question, are there few? Are there few that be saved? The opinion of most of us is that no, just about everybody will be saved. It's not, not scriptural. It's not true, but we come to believe that. We come to deceive ourselves that nobody that I know, my husband, my wife, my children, my parents, my good neighbor, nobody that I know of is literally going to wind up in a place where the, where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. We just come to believe that. We just come to deceive ourselves that somehow God is just going to open the door for them. And so we allow ourselves to think that it's not really concerning us, that we don't have to be concerned we want to be so charitable. We want to be so beneficial in our language toward others. But I am find, find that this is the word of Jesus. The most tender-hearted person who ever walked on the earth, and he came to seek and to save. And he's the one who says to us that hell is there for, he, he talks about it in his word for those who are going to wind up there. But then no, no, notice with me, that it's never been true in all of history that the, the most were saved and the few were lost. You remember when Noah was told to build an ark? God's people, the, well, the, all of the creation had gotten so e evil that God just decided he's going to destroy the world. Noah, I want you to build an ark. Can you imagine how ridiculed that old preacher was? He started to build an ark, and the people passing by must have laughed and mocked and made all kinds of ridicule, saying, that stupid old preacher is building a boat in his backyard, and it's a long way from water. It's never rained, and he's talking about rain. It's scientifically impossible because the earth is watered with a dew. It'll never happen. 120 years, he pleaded with all of his neighbors, with all the people that would hear him. He pleaded, get ready, it's going to rain. One day, God told him to get in the ark, and God shut the door. And it began to rain. I'm sure that must have been a novelty at first. And the, everybody was just out, just enjoying the fact that, well, there's water coming out of the sky until it began to rise. And there were, I'm, I'm confident that there were those who were pounding on the side of that ark saying, let us in. And God's, Noah could say, I didn't shut that door and I can't open it. It's too late. It's too late for you now. This pastor and other preachers have been preaching for years 
that there's coming a time when you're going to stand before God to hear him say, enter into the joys of the Lord or depart from me. I never knew you. We just keep putting it off, putting it off until some other time. But in that ark was only eight people. I have no idea what the population was in the time of Noah. But can you imagine the hundreds and thousands of people and only eight were saved? What about those who were moving from Egypt to Canaan? Oh, they'd heard about the land that flowed with milk and honey. They heard about a place where they would have some marvelous fig trees. They heard about a place where they could just enjoy all the blessings of God. And they got to the crossing almost. Moses sent 12 men to just spy out the land. Ten of them came back saying, we can't take it. Two, two said, God would enable us to go now. Out of all of that 600,000 or more, maybe a million out of that left Egypt, two persons entered Canaan. Oh, the children that grew up entered, but those two originals, that's all. I don't know how many in this congregation are really saved. I certainly wouldn't attempt to save because it's none of my business. My business only to plead with you, strive to enter in at the straight gate. And Jesus uses a strong word when he says strive. It's a word that means agonize. It's the word that in the Olympian games, they strive, they agonize. These, the finest athletes that we have cause themselves to be put through all kinds of rigors day after day in order that they might strive to win that prize. Just a gold medal. Jesus is saying, strive, strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many shall seek to enter in and shall not be able. What do we strive against? The pride of our heart. Because the first thing is to do is to repent. Recognize, you know, repentance is not necessarily a religious word. Nomadic peoples in the desert, no street signs, no road signs, when they get out where they recognize that I'm not getting where I'm supposed to be and it's time to be there, they rec recognize they're going the wrong way and repent and go the other way. My Bible says that we need to repent. Repent of our direction and our life and our having things under control. I was preaching a revival on one occasion and a young lady came down the aisle I asked her to, to kneel where she might repent of her sins. Oh, no. She turned and went out the door. I'm not kneeling. Too proud. Too proud to repent. And many of us with that pride of heart are refusing to say, I need to be saved by God's grace. I need to be changed. I need my life turned around. I need to have something new. And we need to strive against that. We need to strive against false confidence of the fact that somehow if I'm good, if I'm moral, if I keep the law, if I don't abuse somebody, if I don't be a terrorist, then I'm going to make it. We're not going to make it. We need to have Jesus in our hearts. So the strongest words that Jesus ever spoke were in this passage when he says, depart from me, I never knew you. That would be sad to think that we were going to make it. And then to come to that point where you would hear him say, I don't know who you are. You, you might have been in church. You might have heard me in, my, in the many times that I was there. But you are not one of mine. Are you saved? Are you saved? Do you know Jesus as Savior and Lord? If right now, at the stroke of 12, Jesus should come or call for us. Are you ready? Are you ready to go? If not, you can be. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. And if we're not saved, we're lost. Oh, I know where I am, preacher. 
I know who, and on my way home, that's not what I'm talking about. We're lost to his marvelous grace and love. Let me plead with you this morning. Any boy or girl, man or woman, who has never allowed Jesus to come into the heart, never, in, never a time in, in your life when you said, I want to be saved by God's grace. I want you to come today and give your heart to Jesus. What a marvelous day we can have. What a time of rejoicing when people come to let Jesus Christ take their sins and give them life. In a moment, we're going to stand and sing. In a moment, we're going to have an opportunity. And I am invite you. I'm going to invite you to, to turn to, to that person who can save you. Not to the church, not to the preacher, not to some other kind of organization, but to Jesus Christ alone who came to seek and to save. Bow your heads with me for a moment. Father, we come to pray that Damon Patterson can be removed from the picture and the precious Lamb of God can be here almost visibly pleading with everybody here, come unto me, all you that labor are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest to your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit can do what none of us can do, can reach that heart, that life right now, cause that person to say, I've, I've spent enough time in the existence I'm in. I need to come to Jesus. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. May we stand, please. Will you come to him? Will you come seeking the salvation of the Lord? Please come. <clears throat> Anyone, anyone, never been saved, but you'd come to Jesus. He offers you life. He offers you the eternal life. I'm glad you're here. And if you've been, if you've never been saved, I'm glad that you've allowed me to talk to you. But that's not sufficient. You still need to be saved. Would you come to Jesus today? Anyone? What about you that have been saved and you've not? not where God would have you to be today. And you know that. You would come and stand in this altar in testimony to the fact that God saved me, but I want to be a better Christian. Would you do that? Would you come?
bow your heads with me for just a moment. Yeah, bless the Lord. May I ask you to look internally? Is there a peace that resides within your heart? A peace, the Bible says, that passes the understanding of man. Incomprehensible to you and I where such a peace could come from. If that's the case, that would be the Lord living within you. Or perhaps you're here today and Perhaps you've been here other weeks. And there's a sensing within your life that something's missing. And you recognized today, perhaps a few weeks ago, other times that you've been here, other times throughout the week, something's missing. You see, I believe that's something that's missing in every one of our lives unless we've been saved as Jesus. And he will bring you a peace, a peace that you didn't know was possible. So while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, no one looking but me and pastor and Jesus, I'm gonna start at my far left. It's impossible to see this entire sanctuary from one view. So on my far left, if there's a need in your life you've never been saved or perhaps you need a closer walk with Jesus you need a peace could you just all I'd ask you to do is just lift your head look in my direction and say but that simple simple gesture pray for me God bless you who else pray for me pray for me God bless you to my immediate left the same question God bless you Anyone else? God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? My immediate left. My immediate right. Same question goes to you. I'm either not saved or I need a closer walk with my master. And you just look my direction and say, Pastor, would you pray for me? God bless you. God bless you. And to my far right, same question. God bless you. God bless you. You can lift your heads. I say this quite often. I do appreciate the confidence that you've just placed in me, preacher. And when I typically do this, as you respond, I begin to pray in my heart and my mind for you at that very moment. But I can't save you. And I can't give you that peace. And I can't offer you the peace of life living as a child of God but I know one that can and he loves you so much today and I always say this and I truly mean this whenever God speaks there's always a second voice that comes that second voice will say things like what is everybody else in that building going to think if you come for prayer doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. This is between you and God. Will they laugh at me? Will they make fun of me? No, because they've done the very same thing we're asking you to do. And they'll rejoice in their heart when you come. And let me just leave you with this. There's no reason to leave with that emptiness. If you'll just give your life to Christ. If you've never been saved, ask him to save you if you have been and you just need that closer companionship with him ask him I've never known him to force his way into anybody's life but once you offer the invitation Jesus will come could we sing one more verse choir would you please And would you consider right now coming to him not worried about what anybody else thinks says or does you'll come to Jesus today would you do that? What do I do when I come? 
I don't have the answer for that. I know when I came, I never said audible words. My heart got in touch with Jesus. Would you? save the ones that's lost. Amen. Please don't turn him away. I had a daughter that dropped dead with a brain aneurysm at 56 years old. She attended church here. She loved coming. I love coming with her. I've known Brother Larry for years and years. I've known Brother Damon back here since I was a young girl. He married me in JC. He preached my back Lord sermon at the high school when I graduated. I've loved him all these years. But the point I'm going to make to you is she got up one morning, was meeting some friends, and she dropped dead before they ever got there to have lunch with her. We didn't know she had a brain aneurysm. She didn't know she was going to die that day. And I sure didn't. Let me tell you, if you're lost, don't put it off. You don't have the promise of walking out that door. Please. Please, listen to what the Lord is wanting you to do. You may think, I can't do that. I can't go. It'd be the best thing you ever done in your life. I was 11 years old, accepted him. And I have never regretted that moment. He's been good to me. I'm 81 years old. I don't know how much longer I've got to live. I may not walk out that door. But I'll tell you one thing, where I'm going, I'm ready. Amen. Whenever he takes me, I'm ready. Amen. Brother Larry knows he's got my funeral, and he's to preach to my kids and grandkids that don't go to church. And they was brought up in church. Why they've turned, I have no idea. God knows, though, and he'll get their attention. And he will get all of you people's attention that is here that's lost, that needs to find Jesus. Amen. Don't put it off, please. Come to him today. Let him save your soul. He's wanting to. God bless you. Bless your heart. Thank you, Lord. I just felt to do this. Oh, I'm glad you did. Amen. Lord, I'm coming home. I don't know if you got the words to that, but what she just said to you is just another way of God saying, I want to give you one more opportunity. God's so gracious. God's so loving. And what she said to you is true. James said our life is but a vapor. 
appears for just a little while, it's gone away. How about you this morning? While we sing one more verse, that's all. Nobody comes. If you're here today and you need Jesus, you come. If you need a closer walk with him, you come. Would you do that? And if you're here today and you're a child of God, God's moving on your heart to rededicate your life. You may be the catalyst that God uses to reach somebody that's lost. You come today. Would you do that? Coming home. Paths of sin. Too long I've trod. Lord, I'm coming home. How about you? Folks, come pray with David, would you? to talk to our young people for just a second. For those of you that might be visiting, because Brother Damon, I'm the youth pastor here. You know, life really is short. If you've been here any amount of time, you've probably heard me tell this story. And I really feel that God would have me to tell it. There was a church that I attended when I lived in Gaylord, Michigan. And I was in college, and there was a young man who ran a lawn cutting business for that church, and he always hired teenagers during the summertime to let them make a little extra money. And one day they were coming off the workforce to come to revival, and one of the young men that was in that group, he was 17 years old, came to revival and got saved that night. His family wasn't able to be there, so he said, you know, we, we got to go finish up some work but I can't wait to get home and tell mom and dad what happened to me. Well, friend, that boy never made it home. They were in a horrible car crash on the way back to work. Every single one of them died. That man had a family, and all three of those teenagers died with him. But you know what? His confidence that I'm standing here, I know where he is. You don't have time. This life is too short. Myself and other people in this congregation that I know personally will tell you from our work how short life is. Tragedy could strike. I might not make it home. I got a little girl that's coming this Thursday. I may never meet her. I don't know, but I know where I'm going. This message, this, I respect it. I've never met him. 
till Thursday. And I tell you, if there ain't anybody in this room who doesn't have the Spirit of God on him, this man sure does. And if God tells him to send a message like this to your heart, how could you turn that away? How could you look at the Savior who died for you and tell him no? And young people, this isn't just for us old fogies. There's too many of us young people. I, I hope I get to be as old as Brother Damon. I really hope I can get around like he does if I ever make it there. But you know what, young person? You might not make it there. And you say, I'm a teenager. I got all the time in the world. I'm in my 20s. I'm in my 30s. I got, I got life ahead of me. I got time. No, friend, you don't. That date that's stamped on the bottom of your foot, you can't see it. But there's a day coming when God's pulling your name and it's time for you to leave. But where are you going to go? This world tells you so many things. Makes everything, let's be happy, let's feel good. But you know what, friend? They don't tell you that there's a real hell. There's a place that you will go. It's not a joke. It's not a place to go party. You're not going to go there with your friends and just have a good time. Hell is real. But you know what? Just as real as hell is, there's a place you can go where God himself is going to be. I can't wait to get there and just look at his face. The man who would give his life to save my sorry soul. I don't know. I won't care what anything else looks like other than what he gives is to me. Don't leave without making it right. What do you got to lose? Let me ask you. What do you have to lose? I'm up here bawling like a baby. You think I care? No. Because if it touches your heart, I'll stand up here and cry all day long. Because you know why? My Savior is that real to me. And if you're saying, come up with all the excuses you want, they won't hold their weight in water when you meet your Savior. He's going to ask you one question. Did you make me my, make me yours? Did you make me your Savior? Or did you crown something else in your life? I'm a firm believer in the fact that God's Spirit's as real as I'm standing here and it's in this place. And He didn't send this man to send a message for absolutely nothing. He sent it because He knows you're lost. And don't take for granted the message that He sent to you. He sent it to you directly to you. God took the time out of all the 7 billion people that are in this world, took the time out of His day to come down to your level and send you a message. As we sing one more verse, don't take that for granted. Come. Please come. You come if you feel like it. say this if God has touched your heart and there's several in here 
based on my experience over the years, uh, there's a countenance change that comes upon people when God's dealing with them, and I've seen that on several this morning. But it's not my job to point that out to you. That's God's job to point that out to you. But here's what I'd, I would encourage you to do. We're going to go down and enjoy a good meal that our people have prepared for you. Two things. I didn't bring anything, Pastor. Please, I beg you. There's times we can't bring things. We're a family. You just come down and enjoy with us. And we're going to meet back in here at 2.45 after we eat. I sincerely believe in my heart, if God has touched you or touched somebody with you that's with you today, if you'll see they're back here in this service this afternoon, uh, I can't guarantee you, but I can guarantee you this. I can guarantee you God will speak to hearts. He's, he always has and he always will. The choice is yours, that's right. but God will speak to hearts. So we invite you to come fellowship with us with this pastor and then at 245 we'll meet back in here uh, we'll have a short service I believe it'll be so short that I we may not even have preaching the Lord just may move in a great and a mighty way and needs get met if you place them at the hand of Jesus we love you and we appreciate you God bless you you're at liberty to be dismissed down there oh let me make one more announcement I'm sorry um over here, immediately, as soon as amen is, as soon as I tell you you're ready to go, if you're interested in a trip to the Creation Museum and the Ark in the Cincinnati and the Kentucky area, please meet us over here for a very brief meeting, and then we'll go down and eat. The rest of you just go on down and enjoy.